a middle aged patient is received he quotes that his left small finger got caught up in the coat button of a co-worker and was forcefully deviated onwards he felt a snap and angular deformity developed at the pip joint and he was unable to fully extend the digit the thought process would be a volar pip rotatory dislocation lateral pip dislocation pip joint fracture dislocation or pip joint sprain anyhow in our case an x ray was done and which showed a lateral dislocation of proximal interphalangeal joint clinical examination showed sensory function to be intact on both sides of the digits a digital block was placed and the dislocation was reduced with a gentle longitudinal traction radiograph examination confirmed a concentric reduction of pip joint with symmetric joint space while still anesthetized the finger was examined to assess stability of the joint and integrity of extensor mechanism the patient was able to actively move the digit throughout the range of motion there was no subluxation noted the integrity of extensor mechanism and central slip insertion was then tested by having the patient extend the pip joint against examiner resistance at with the mcp joint flexed there was full extension with normal strength compared with the uninjured digit the digit was splinted with the pip joint in the full extension the patient was seen at next two weeks appointment with a radiograph confirming maintaining or soft the reduction after two weeks the digit was body tapped with the adjacent finger and range of motion was started due to some mild laxity in the healing radial collateral ligament the body strapping was continued for four weeks after which a full painless range of motion was achieved now a radiographic examination for a lateral dislocated pip joint is sufficient to diagnose the injury depending on the plane of the radiograph however confusion between the true lateral dislocation and a volar rotator dislocation is quite common this distinction is important because the extensor mechanism is disrupted in volar rotator dislocation as the head of the proximal phalanx protrudes through the triangle of the ligament between the lateral band and the central slip the rotatory component of the volar dislocation can be suggested on plain x-rays if one view of the digit show a true lateral of the proximal phalanx with an oblique radiograph of the middle phalanx this can help the practitioner to distinguish between these injuries in a straight lateral dislocation the extensor mechanism may or may not be injured a lateral dislocation results from a lateral directed force or torsional force acting on the extended pip joint the radial collateral ligament is injured six times more frequently than ulnar collateral ligament true lateral dislocation of the pip joint is relatively rare when compared with the dorsal or volar rotatory dislocations however the patient himself or, or an athletic trainer prior to presentation probably reduces some of these dislocations like the more common dorsal dislocation the clinician must be wary of any significant injury to the pip joint as stiffness pain and the limited use may supervene even with appropriate treatment the symptoms may continue to improve after the injury so education of the easily frustrated patient is particularly important the biomechanical studies of the constraints about the pip joint have demonstrated that collateral ligaments may fail at any point along their course including an avulsion fracture of the from the phalanges the location of ligament failure is dependent on the rate at which the lateral stress is applied failure of the proximal portion of the ligament is more common after reduction and while under digital block anesthesia the degree of injury of the collateral ligament may be assessed by extent to which the joint opens up on application of lateral stress opening over 20 degrees is said with 100% chance of complete failure of the collateral ligaments whereas opening less than 20 degrees is stated with only 50% chance of complete rupture 
Although this information is not useful in case of documented dislocation, it may become useful in instances when, when the patient reports an injury to the PIP joint, which has been self-reduced. An intact lateral band will extend the PIP joint and may mask an injury to the central slip. Therefore, it is important to isolate central slip injuries while testing for injuries of extensor mechanism to whatever extent is possible. Flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint places the lateral band at a mechanical disadvantage, allowing preferential assessment of the integrity of the central tendon insertion. Missed injuries of the central slip may result in botanary deformity, which is potentially one of the major pitfall in the management of PIP injuries. Due to the bony architecture of PIP joint, the constructive reduction usually provides sufficient stability to allow for early motion within the limits of reasonable comfort. The arc through which the joint is stable should be assessed at the time of injury to avoid subluxation or redislocation. This is best done when the joint is anesthetized, preferably with the digital block. Those factors that need to be considered in selecting the optimal position of the joint immobilization include the water plate, collateral ligament, and the extensor mechanism. In lateral dislocation, the water plate is generally evolved from the base of the middle phalanx, so splintage in 20 to 30 degree of flexion would seem prudent to avoid laxity and subsequent hyperextension. It even demonstrated that intact PIP joint is most restrained to lateral stress in full extension. This implies that the collateral ligaments are most tough in full extension. Immobilization in slight flexion therefore would allow the ligament to begin healing in a slight shorter position, possibly avoiding the development of laxity. However, if injury or to the extensor mechanism is suspected, the joint should be submitted in full extension to avoid the complication of progenitor deformity. Regardless of position of immobilization, motion should be instituted as early as possible. The common complication of PIP joint injuries is stiffness and not laxity. Water plate and collateral ligament injury should be mobilized as soon as the patient is comfortable providing the joint is stable. Central tendon injuries should be protected longer for about three weeks and then mobilized, protecting the extensor mechanism with dynamic extension splints. Interestingly, repair of the injured collateral ligaments and the water plate in acute setting does not improve the outcome and may result in increased stiffness of the joint. Acute surgical intervention is reserved for cases of incongruate reductions, generally from a tissue interposed within the joint. Stern has described a standard type lesion after lateral dislocation of PIP joint in which the collateral ligaments are incarcerated between the lateral band and the central slip. The stating operative intervention. Although this lesion would seem more likely in both rotator dislocation in which the triangular ligament uh, between the lateral band and central slip is ruptured, it may be seen in true lateral dislocations. Thank you.